Thank you. So can you hear me? Yeah, good. So um, what we have seen, the result of this morning, we have started from a very general assumption regarding conformal field theories. Uh, then we, we look at a particular, any scalar operator in that field theory, in that conformal field theory, that we call, let's say, phi. You can call it O, it also works. And then we have seen that if this is part of the spectrum, then the, the conformal field theory also contains, then there exist double trace operators, or some sort of composite operators, Whose of the form, well, here there are many notations. So some people, this is like phi box phi, many derivatives phi, or some people also denote these operators like phi phi and L. And the, the important point about these operators is that the twist is two times the twist or two times the dimension of this field phi plus 2n plus corrections that decay with L in some way. And then their OP coefficient is also the OP coefficient of generalized three fields up to corrections that decay with L. So, what this means, in other words, we have seen that any conformal field theory in any number of dimensions, high greater than two, contains a large spin sector, and this large spin sector is essentially free, in the sense that the CFT data for that large spin sector is the same data as the data for generalized free fields. The idea so what, yes? Sorry, double trace doesn't mean anything. Uh, and that's why on purpose, I, I chose to write just T. And some people uses the word trace, and some people uses the word twist. None of them is <laughs> quite... Um, so the, the, the important point, so there are some theories, like n equals 4 super Yanni Mills, and people distinguishes. There are these sort of operators, trace, sorry, this is too small, trace of, of a scalar field, many derivatives, and another scalar field. And the anomalous dimensions of this operator is not of this form. But, and these operators, are the operators that you would call single trace operators because there is only a single trace. On the other hand, this one is an operator of the theory. So the theorem on the left implies that these kind of operators does have an anomalous dimension, etc., that a scaling dimension, dimension that becomes like that. So people in the literature, especially n equals 4 super Yanni Mills, they started distinguishing, and they call these operators single trace operators, and these operators double trace operators. And in a way, then people decided that the name was not very good, so they started calling them double twist, in the sense that their twist is twice the twist of another operator of the theory. And yeah, so, so that, that's, it's just a name but it's this sort of composite operators. Uh, we will go back to single trace operators versus double trace operators uh, later. But the theorem we have proven is that in any conformal field theory, if O is part of the spectrum, then this tower of operators also has to be part of the spectrum. It may not be all of it. There may be other operators like O itself, which is not of that form, but for sure we have all these high towers of composite operators. Is that okay? Right. So, so, in large, so notice, by the way, 
that here we are not assuming large n or, or anything. So if you take n equals four super n meals with three flavors or two flavors or five flavors, all this will still be true there. And, and uh, your comment, actually, if n is not large, it doesn't make even sense to talk about single trace and double trace because of all these things may mix. That's why it's a little misleading. But certainly, there are these kind of composite operators. It doesn't matter the name you give to them, and they behave like this. The idea of large spin perturbation theory, what we are going to do today, yes. Oh, I, no, that will not be necessary. And I don't think it will be true in general. Yeah. Uh, yes, we are not going to assume that. Uh, if I assume that, I will try to make clear that I am assuming that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So this vanishes. So the aim of this, of this idea of large spin perturbation theory is to try to develop a theory to compute all these subleading coefficients here. So this goes like some coefficient over L, something else over L squared, etc. And we will try to, to develop a theory to try to understand how to efficiently compute all these coefficients in one over L. This is quite cool because it means, so the, this analytic bootstrap is giving us results for large spin, but we would like to push that for smaller and smaller spins. So the way, one way to do that is by trying to compute corrections to these operators in one over L. And the idea we will use, we will exploit the following very simple idea. And again, I will work with a very simple toy model so, so that you can work everything by yourselves. And remember that the idea, what led to that conclusion was the fact that in the crossing equation, we had something like this. This, sorry, is a shorthand notation for the square of the OPE coefficient, tau over two, conformal blocks, tau L U V. And then because of crossing symmetry and because of the identity operator, on the right hand side, we have something like U to the V to the delta phi. And then plus dot, dot, dot. And the crucial observation we have made was that enhanced divergences as V goes to zero, and by enhanced, what I mean is with respect to a single conformal block or any finite number of conformal blocks, is in one-to-one -one correspondence or is in correspondence with the behavior at large spin of the CFT data on the left hand side. So from that simple observation, we derived that just from the existence of the identity operator on, on the right, on the cross channel, on the left, there should be infinite operators, an infinite number of operators, which for large spin have this CFT data. Is that okay? Yes. Right, sorry. So I, I would, I, so remember that a single conformal block diverges as the log of V, as V goes to zero. So if here you obtain something that is stronger or that you cannot get from a finite number of conformal blocks, then this is going to tell you something 
about the larger spin behavior of the left-hand side. Is that okay? And we are going to exploit that fact. Uh, I am sorry, this looks like a dry question. Actually, once we answer this question, we will use this to solve for a lot of conformal field theories. So it's actually it's a very it's, it's a important question. And we will try to study this problem. We will study this problem. We will start with in the uh, let's study this problem in the collinear limit. Remember, because already in this limit, so I wrote down the a sum in this small u limit, and already from this limit is a problem in only one variable, and from that problem we will be able to learn to learn a lot. So first, just so that you can read better the literature if you ever decide to do that, it is better to use set set bar, set, set bar variables. And in, remember that in terms of set set bar, u is equal to set set bar and v is 1 minus set, 1 minus set bar. And then, for us, what here is, so we will take a small v as set bar going to 1. So for us, taking a small v will be the same as taking set bar going to 1, while a small u is small set. So, in terms of set set bar variables, we will study this problem in the small set limit, and that is the same uh, as, as this small u limit. Yes? No, sorry, no, sorry. So this definition, yeah, thank you for the question. So although I, I have made this definition uh, regarding conformal blocks in four dimensions, you can make this in any number of dimensions. Uh, sorry? Yeah, also in all dimensions, yes. And it's also useful in that context. Yes, thank you, actually, for the remark. So, remember, uh, so we have solved a nice problem uh, having to, when, when dealing with generalized three fields, and the problem we have solved was a very neat equation and let me write down the equation for you. The sum of the OPE coefficients for generalized free fields to delta L. So this, remember, this was the problem where we studied the divergence in the small u limit. Here is identical, but we are just studying in, in this variable, such set bar, times the hypergeometric functions, k okay, phi plus L of set bar, and let me be super precise. So here, what I mean by this, so kh of set bar is equal to set bar to the h, 2f1, h, h, 2h set bar, and then, what we have seen is that for generalized free fields, if we plug automat if we plug the OP coefficients I just gave in the previous lecture, then the right hand side was u over v, but in set variables, in set set bar variables, that's set bar over one minus set bar to the delta phi plus something regular as set bar goes to 1. So, this is a neat example of, of, of the phenomenon we were talking about when dealing with generalized three fields. And notice that on the right-hand side, we have this important term that has enhanced singularities. Again, enhanced singularities. We will be more precise in a while, in, in a little bit, but means something that you cannot get from an infinite number of conformal blocks. So certainly, this negative power of 1 minus set bar 
is an enhanced singularity. Is that okay? Yes. So here, if you do set bar going to one, the right hands. Oh, <laughs> yes. Sorry about. That. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Is that okay? So this just in this variable set set bar is the beautiful equation we wrote towards the end of, of my previous lecture. But now, bear with me. So we are going to, yes, to a single conformal block. Sorry, again, it is bigger than, yes. Well, log b, which in terms of set bar, will be log of 1 minus set bar. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the moral is if you have on the right hand side something that you cannot obtain from a finite number of conformal blocks, then that will tell you something about this for large spin. Is that okay? And now I am going to give you a much harder problem. A much harder problem. Imagine that you are happy uh, for one second with that you have understood this. This is actually a baby version of the following problem. Imagine that I ask you, find AL such that sum over L. So if I want to be super specific, this is even L. This you can check with Mathematica, you can check in a lot of ways, it's actually quite neat. AL, some AL that you need to find, times K, delta phi plus L set bar, is equal to some function of set bar. And this function, is a given, is, is the, the data of the problem, given GC, with an enhanced singularity. Or a singularity as set bar goes to one. Is that large enough? Yeah. So this is the problem we want to solve. Now, this is a very hard problem, right? Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Yes, set bar goes to one. Sorry about that. Um, I thought it would be confusing for you, and maybe it isn't if I don't keep making that mistake or over and over. So the baby idea. So basically, in, in, a, in a baby version, this method of large spin perturbation theory is a method to actually solve this problem. We are going to find AL in such a way that for if you hand me any J of set bar, I tell you what the, the AL is. And then we will show towards the end of this lecture and the beginning and, and all the, the whole lecture how, if you combine that with crossing, you can solve for a lot of things in conformal field theories. And we are talking about things that take years and years using Feynman diagrams. So bear with me, it's a bit technical. But the basic idea to solve that problem, yes? Oh. Yes, except here. So this, this by itself, this problem does not necessarily arise from crossing. So this is a problem you can ask in general. If I give you these divergences, whether you can reconstruct these coefficients here in such a way that with the conformal blocks, which in the baby version are just these hypergeometric functions, whether you can reconstruct this data from this. We will see how powerful this is, but before I, I thought I would give you 
the idea in just this one-dimensional uh, vector. And the, the first idea of, of, of the method is we notice, so the first point, which is a, a beautiful fact, actually, is that there is a Casimir operator, and I will be super explicit here, there is an operator D bar such that if you act with D bar on K delta phi plus L set bar, then you get back a number, now I, I am going to write what that is, delta phi plus L set bar. Where, again, I am going to be super explicit, this D bar is set bar square, D set bar, 1 minus set bar, D set bar. And J square is equal to delta phi plus L, delta phi plus L minus 1. So, this case, they satisfy some, uh, they satisfy these nice second order differential equations. You can check again. Um, these basically are the same as the differential equations satisfied by the, by the hypergeometric functions. And now we do the following. So the trick to solve that problem is this. Let's imagine, let's start with this. So this is something we know. So let me erase this. But this k is just some hypergeometric function. This we know. And now, this thing, we call it the function here on the right-hand side. We give it a name and call it h0 of set bar. And then, we are going to define a family of functions, very much the same, But then we add an extra insertion of j to the 2m, where j square is this object here. It looks like something a little bit random. I promise you it's not. Uh, and this, we also give it a name. We give it the name hm of set bar. But now, there is something quite cool going on. Of course, to prove this sum is quite complicated. It's not that complicated. But if you have to do this, let's say, in an exam, you would cry very much, because you are like a screw, right? This, to compute this is extremely complicated. But actually, there is a trick to compute this. And the trick is that if we act on this equation here, with d bar, this quadratic operator, this implies a very nice relation. It implies that d bar of h m plus 1 of set bar is equal to h m of set bar. This is quite cool, right? Because what this gives is some sort of recurrence relation. You see, so H0, you know. And then this quadratic operator relates H0, H1 to H0, H2 to H1, and so on. And the thing is that, um, the beautiful thing is that this recursion relation here, together with this result, which is the result 
that you knew from generalized three fields actually allows you to compute. You can construct all HM of set bar. And, and one way, for instance, you can construct them. Well, you can construct them in different ways. I, I, I will give you an example in, in a little while. Are there any questions about this? Uh, yes, we will do that in one second. So for now, I, I, I am taking the small set limit. We will reintroduce that in a second, in a few minutes. And then, but for the moment, we have this, this set of functions. These functions are very well defined. They are just defined by this. And then they, they satisfy this nice recursion relation with this very explicit operator here. And then you can use that rather than doing the whole sum that would be very hard to derive this. I, I would write one in a few minutes. And now, but now, you see, you come here to this equation and you say, aha, what happens if I propose an expansion for AL such that this AL is the answer from gen for generalized free fields times alpha naught plus alpha 1 j square plus alpha 2 j to the 4 plus dot, dot, dot. So what we are assuming is that the AL, our ansatz, is that our AL is generalized free fields times something that admits an expansion for large spin. For simplicity, I take here only even powers. Actually, you can even analytically continue in this coefficient m. So that's not a problem. It's just to simplify your life. But then there is something quite cool. Because now you take this, you plug that here, and you see that what we are left with on the left-hand side are our beautiful functions. So the problem we wanted to solve has become alpha zero, H zero set bar, plus alpha one, H one set bar, plus dot dot dot, and this has to be equal to G offset bar. Oh, no, no, sorry, it's what I just mentioned. Just for notation, I, I, I am going to, to make things very simple, but actually you can, uh, you, you can compute these functions even for non-integer m. So you can even analytically continue in m. So depending on the G you have here, you may need odd powers. You may even need weirder things, but I, I don't want to talk about I, I don't want to, to be too complicated, but actually this is not a strong assumption. It's just for notational issue. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes. So basically, remember, J is already like L squared. So J is a function of L. So what we have made, what we have done, we trade the L depend so L is hidden here in this J, because this J is this. So these alphas are some fixed coefficients. But now we are in very good shape because I told you that you could compute these functions here. So these functions are computable functions and, and they have some enhanced singularities. That is all you need to compute. And then, by matching the singularities here, matching singularities, you can fix iteratively, as far as, as you wish, 
alpha zero, alpha one, etc. Is that okay? So, what this is doing, I will give you an example in one minute. What this is doing is, is solving the problem of finding this AL as a series expansion. And what one sees is that rather than doing a series expansion in one over L, one is better to do a series expansion in one over this J or J squared. Is that okay? So this is the idea. Yes. Yes. So if delta phi is equal to three halves, right, I will work an example. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. You are on the right track. The, the details are slightly different, but that, that's a good point. Yes. So good. Is, that, is everyone happy? Yes. Uh, yes, right. So the idea, so let, let me work out. So I think this, this question will be better if I work out. Let's work out an example where we actually compute this function's h. What do you think? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Right. We will talk about that later, either at the end of this lecture or at the beginning of the next one. There could be... So for here, I just took the simplest example to show you how this works. And, and, um, and, and there will be... Uh, I will come back to that later. And there could be even situations in which you have a log j in the numerator. Even that you can accommodate. Because since you can analytically continue in this coefficient m, you could take derivatives with respect to m. And that will give you log j, for instance. So this is actually pretty powerful, although here I am just using, you know, like the simplest example. So maybe all this will be a little less abstract if we work out a very specific example and you see precisely which kind of functions appear. Is that okay? Shall we do that? Yes. Absolutely, it is. It is some, like, it's related to the small set limit of the previous Casimir operator. Yes, yes. But since here, I decided to give it because it's so nice. You know, it's a small, the other one is very large, and it's neat. And you can check, right, with Mathematica. You take these hypergeometric functions, you act, and you get all excited because it's proportional. So it's nice. Now, let's work an example. And, and uh, yes, so let's work out a, a very specific example. And, and the example I wanted to work, just you see. So if I write here, can people there see? If I write, or you would rather me, you would rather me, yeah? I never get what the answer is. But the <laughs> That's usually in life, it's not only here. So, uh, yeah, so let, let's keep that, let's keep that. And here, but I need this too, you see. Uh, okay. Okay, let, let's, sorry about that. So I, I will delete, I will do something here. And we will work all these examples. We will work all these examples. And you will see also the answer to your question. And let's take the neatest example, and, and already what you said already happens, is if you set delta phi to 2, right? So delta phi is equal to 2. And if you go to your, to your notes and you set delta phi equals 2 here, right? So this is like that, and here you set delta phi also equals 2, you see that you get set bar divided 1 minus set bar square. 
And that's what it tells you, what this tells you, is that if, for instance, you had a problem where you have a two here, because delta phi is equal to two, and here you are asked to give this, then the answer you know is simply that AL is the generalized three fields. But now let's compute A1. And A1 is such that D bar of H1 of Z bar is equal to H0 of Z bar. And you can go and check with Mathematica H1 actually has a very neat expression and is of the form z bar over 1 minus z bar. It's quite cool. And if you act on z bar divided 1 minus z bar with this, uh, with d bar here, you will obtain exactly z bar divided 1 minus z bar. So it's quite neat. Now, your question, the question of today, was what happens if you have H2? Because it looks like this one is a little bit less singular than this one. And it looks like the next one may not be singular at all. However, what we find solving the same equation, now d bar of H2 equals to H1, we find that H2 of set bar is actually very neat. It's one half of log square of one minus set bar. Plus something regular, which we are not uh, going to care about. So H2 is also, has also an enhanced divergence. But it has then an enhanced divergence in a funny way. It doesn't have a power law divergence, it has a log square divergence. And if you compute H3, H4, H5, etc., these also, they all have some log square. And this log square certainly is an enhanced divergence because it cannot arise from a finite number of conformal blocks. Is it okay? So this is what happens. So, question. Let's say that I tell you that this, on the right-hand side, I would like to have, uh, let's make it easy, one half of log square, one minus set bar. Can you tell me what is the solution for this AL? Sorry? The? Absolutely. And A2 is equal to 1 means that in the large J expansion, this is generalized free fields divided by J to the 4. And J to the 4 is just this. So L is equal to 2. Delta phi so is equal to 2. So it's 2 plus L. L plus 1 square, square, period. So if you are given a, a divergence that is like log square of one minus set bar, the answer is the generalized three fields divided two plus L square, one plus L square. We didn't need to do any sum, by the way. I am lazy, so I, I will try to avoid working as much as I can, yes. Absolutely. And if you, yes, that's, and again, another beautiful observation. Actually, if you say that delta phi is not an integer, then you can keep going. But by matching powers, right, you can still, uh, you, you can fix all these coefficients. Is that okay? Is that all right? Yes.
I, I, I am not talking about this, right? I am just solving a one-dimensional problem having to do with a hypergeometric functions. Yeah, so certainly this has to do with conformal field theories. But now the connection, we will see it in one second. Is that, yeah, I, I hope to answer your question in one second. But this is a baby model where actually everything can be understood, and you can see really how you can solve this, this, uh, this sort of questions. Is that okay? Yeah? Good. Any questions? Any more questions? Very nice. So let's now try to, to... So the idea is basically this one. Now what I will do, I will connect back to conformal field theories, and we will see how this uh, helps to solve conformal field theories. We will solve today our first interacting conformal field theory a little bit without doing any Feynman diagram computations. So the idea with U and V is very similar. So imagine now we are not taking the small UV limit, so uh, generic UV. And we do basically the same idea. So now we define, so let's start with generalized free fields in exactly the same way. But now, in, in each sum, we sum over the spin exactly as before. But now the twist doesn't have to be the smallest twist as before. It can be any 2 delta phi plus n. So we keep this 2 delta phi plus n. We keep this twist fixed. And then we have the full conformal blocks. Now we are not taking any limit. And this function, this function, we just call it h tau zero uv. So since now we are not doing the leading twist anymore because we are not taking the small u limit anymore, we, need, we have one more index, that is the little n here. Actually, so, yeah, so this is tau of n, tau n. Is that okay? And here, the twist is 2 delta phi plus 2n, sorry about that. And in exactly the same way as before, remember that also the full conformal blocks are actually, uh, they have a Casimir operator in exactly the same way. It's just that, of course, now the Casimir operator will be much more complicated. But the beautiful thing is that, again, you can define the same exactly the same combinations with j to the 2m. This is always fixed twist. And here, you add this index m. So exactly the same as before, but this is the generalization to two variables of this. And the beautiful thing So let, let me tell you a few things, and then we will go ahead and, and solve. Um, yes. Is that there are these functions, h, tau, and m, uv, satisfy again very nice properties. So the first property is that if you take the four-point function of generalized free fields, we will call it g naught uv. Recall, this is 1 plus u over v to the delta phi plus u to the delta phi. This is just equal to the sum over all twists of h tau 0 uv. This is, of course, very easy to see because by definition, H0 is the same as the conformal block decomposition of the full correlator, but you are only summing over the spin. 
Then, if you sum over the twist, you will get the full answer. Is that okay? The second property is that, again, you have a Casimir operator. You have a Casimir operator. And this Casimir operator, again, relates the m plus 1 to h tau m uv. Now, it's a little bit more complicated because you have two variables. This Casimir operator is, is a little bit more complicated, but conceptually, it's actually identical. And um, another, another, um, another feature that, that is sometimes useful is basically the question of today, is that this, if you look at the limit of uv, this goes like 1 over b to the delta phi minus this m. And this is the small v behavior. So, and again, this should be interpreted. This is if delta phi minus m is not an integer. If it is an integer, it becomes this log square of v that we have seen before. Is that okay? So these are our basic properties. And what are we doing, really? Remember that what, what we had, so what is hard about conformal blocks, why it is not correct to expand a conformal block around v equals zero and then do the sum, is because first you need to do the sum and then you can take the limit. These objects, which sometimes are called twist conformal blocks, they do the sum for you. So we have learned an efficient way to do the sums over the spin. And now we are led with functions that have a very nice behavior around small u and small v. Is that okay? So this, the idea is identical to, uh, to what we were trying, we were trying to, do, to do on the other side. Right. So in, in most examples, yeah, so that, that's a very important question. So it, unless delta phi is 1 or something like this, this j square is, is, uh, is never 0. So this is usually not a problem. But I must add that if you are only interested in the enhanced divergences of these twist conformal blocks, then you can also cut off the sum at any spin, and that won't matter. Yes. No, I mean, so, so this H here, this H, what the claim, sorry, the claim is that they have a nice calculable expansion around a small both, U and V. Uh, but they will not be regular, but you can compute how, how they behave around a small V. And a small U, is u to the tau over 2. This is very easy, because here you can really expand each conformal block. So that's not, this is easy. This is more non-trivial. Is that OK? Yes. 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 Uh, absolutely. So it's some earlier expression, right. Actually, the yes, you are fully right. And I think it is very much that, but you have a n as well, here and here. So if you take, so you can shift the earliest expression because to the quadratic Casimir, you can always add a constant. And, and, and you can achieve in such a way that is this, but it has an n here and here as well. Good observation. Thank you. Is that OK? So I try to manage to bore you to death, and now we are going to compute something. So let, let's try to see this into action. Let's try to see why we should be interested. About, I mean, why, um, 
uh, people is more or less happy with this. Now, in order to, to see this into action, we will solve our first interacting conformal field theory. And the kind of things, so the theory we are going to solve are corrections to generalize free fields. Yeah. So, generalize free fields is a, a family of theories of correlators that appear when you study large N conformal field theories. And these large N conformal field theories are usually um, important, for, relevant for the ADS-CFT duality. So this is actually quite interesting. It is a quite, quite an interesting uh, system to study. We will come back to that a little bit more maybe tomorrow, but we will study 1 over n corrections to generalize free fields. And we will see how that method helps to, to, to compute this. So the idea is that the four-point correlator of our theory admits a decomposition where this is the zero order generalized free fields, U over B, plus some correction of 1 over N squared, G1 UV. Where G0 is this equation here. Plus dot, dot, dot. We are going to, to just look at this correction here. Then you can ask, you can wonder where these corrections to, to generalize free fields may arise from. So the first point is that in generalized free fields, we have these double trace operators and their dimension tau of NL is equal to 2 delta phi plus 2n. And then we are assuming, we, we think, that this can get a correction of order 1 over n squared. So generalized free fields, the double trace operators, get a correction which is of order 1 over n squared. And in exactly the same way, the OP coefficients also well, delta A or A1, you can call it in different ways, and L. So this is one thing. So the intermediate operators, operators that were already there at order n to the zero, may acquire a correction, will acquire a correction of order 1 over n squared. A couple of years, but well, anyway, so, so let me. So this may look like a simple problem, but actually, it wasn't solved until a couple of years. And if you try to solve it in some other way, it's extremely complicated problems. Yes, sorry. Yes. Yes. If you let me, yes, indeed. Yes. <laughs> so, sorry. So, the reason why I wrote one is because there is more than one bullet, two. Yes, that's a good point. So, uh, sorry, this is the twist. Sorry, tau uh, is this one, right? You mean? It's tau and L is the twist. So, remember that in generalized three fields, the twist of the double trace operator labeled by N and L 
was 2 delta phi plus 2n. Of course, in general, I three fields, that doesn't depend on L. But now, if we put corrections to it, we will not have generalized three fields anymore, and we will have 1 over n, gamma and L. But in addition, absolutely, we can also have, we can also have new operators appearing in the OPE may appear at order to order 1 over n square. And what we would like to solve, either with a new operator or without a new operator, we would like to ask the question, which spectrum of anomalous dimensions, gamma and L, is consistent with crossing symmetry? And crossing symmetry, let's assume that the external operator doesn't get corrected by N, so crossing symmetry is V to the delta phi, G1 UV is equal to U to the delta phi, G1 V2. So, one can actually solve this problem. It was solved for some specific delta phi's in the early days of the, of the ADS-CFT duality, and that's what one of the things uh, where one uses Witten diagrams, and one can actually do this computation. It's like a sort of a Feynman diagram computation, and we are trying to rederive that. We are trying to do this just from the point of view of symmetries. You don't need to do any integrals or any anything. And, and let's see how that works. So is the problem clear? Yes. Okay, it's just a name for now. I, I, I know, uh, actually, in some systems it, it is 1 over n, but, but in most systems it's actually 1 over n squared. So, more generally, it's the central charge. It's 1 over the central charge. In the theories I have in mind, that's usually n squared, but uh, you're right. Eh? But it's just a name. We are never used, so it's just a small deformation to generalize three fields, and we are asking which small deformation is consistent with crossing symmetry. Yeah? Let's try to answer that question. So, we will use... Uh, yes. So, I, I can erase here. Yes. This G and in the... Ne yes. I mean, so, so yes, it is possible. So, sometimes what you get... I mean, of course, at linear order, you call that G, but then you can compute all these enhanced singularities at order G square, and they come from the square of the CFT data at the previous order. So it will appear, the, the square of that thing. You could have called it G, and then G square will appear later on. Yes. So now what we are going to do, so we want to solve this problem now, so let me, I, I don't want to get too much over time today because there is this big thing afterwards. Um, so now we are going to do the following. Recall that as always, our below four point function can be expand in terms of conformal blocks. Nothing new here. And now, again, you can do this with Mathematica. You get here this little tau over there in the power of u, and then you plug tau nl equals 
2 delta phi plus 2n plus 1 over n square gamma in L. And then what we are going to do, we are going to expand this expression, this power, in 1 over n, in powers of 1 over n. This is quite simple to do. And what you see is that the G1 has a term which is the sum. So basically, you plug here for A and for tau. In principle, also here, you plug these two expansions. You put them there. You expand. And then you see that G1 contains a piece which is just the sum of generalized free fields, L, U, now uh, delta phi plus N, times gamma NL over 2, F tau L, UV, times log U plus dot, dot, dot. Is that okay? S sorry, say again. Sorry, so this is the zero order tau. So here you need uh, 2 delta phi plus 2n. Absolutely. So the important point, the important point, is that when you expand, the only piece with a log u will arise when you expand this one here. And all the others, the one here and the one here, you can put the ones at zero order, the ones for generalized free fields. So the piece of G1, which is proportional to log u, is quite easy to, to write down and will always be proportional to the same OPE decomposition as before, but with this gamma NL over 2 insertion. Is that okay? Yeah? So it's just a piece of log U. I am not telling that the whole four-point function is like that, but the piece proportional to log U has that insertion. And this just arises from the fact that if you put this in here, this expansion of this has only integer powers of U, so that will not give you a log U. And that's it. So it can only come from here. Is that okay? And it's just this. But now, now we do our trick. We do our trick. And what is our trick? Our trick is to assume that gamma and L, let me put that 2, times some B and 1, J squared. You could start at 0 but uh, it doesn't matter, j to the 4 plus dot, dot, dot. So we are going to assume that the anomalous dimension that we are talking about admits an expansion in inverse powers of j. This actually turns out to follow from crossing and uh, there was, like, you are too young to remember, 15 years ago, people were very excited about this reciprocity principle. In, in, uh, you are not excited because you are too young. But um, <laughs> and, uh, anyway, and from here, it follows immediately from crossing. So it's like, you know, they were like years trying to check it in different methods. And it's basically the statement that if you do expansions in this right variable, then it's just even powers, and they were very surprised by that. And anyway, so here is quite immediate and follows from crossing. But what I want to do is something a little different, because now, if we take this and we plug this here back, what do we get? We get our functions h. In other words, in other words, so let me erase this. Remember this, please.
In other words, what we see is that this G1, the piece proportional to log U, is equal to sum over N and M of B and M H tau N of generalized fifths M U V log U. This is actually very cool. What we are saying is that the logarithmic log u part of the correction to the four-point function is a linear combination of these functions h, of these twist conformal logs. And that linear combination, the coefficients of that linear combination, are exactly the same as the coefficients of the large J expansion of the anomalous dimensions we want to find. Uh, say again. Uh, oh, I haven't said anything yet, so I am working on the left yet. I, I, I am not sure I understand the question. Yes. Oh, for the moment, I am not saying anything. I, I will now get an equation for this piece. This piece may well be zero. And, and, and they will be in a second, some of them. Yeah, you, you are absolutely right. But for the moment, I am doing very general things. I could have put a one here as well. And, and then this starts at zero. But the, the, the statement is that the piece that goes like log u is always a linear combination of these functions, HUB, right? But now, again, we are puzzled for a little bit, but then crossing comes to our help. Because crossing symmetry, crossing symmetry tells you, aha, uh -huh. but then it means that the sum over Nm of B and M of H tau N M U V has to be necessarily U over V to the delta phi G V U. And here I, am, I have to look only at the log u piece. Now, this looks like we haven't achieved so much, right? However, there is something very cool going on. And the cool thing is that once we have written the crossing equation like that, we can expand both sides for a small v. So the idea now is that once we have done that, and we will be more specific in a second, but the important point is that both sides can be expanded for a small v. And then matching enhanced singularities we can fix we will do that in a second all coefficients b and m in other words once we have done that, we can then compute gamma and L to all orders in 1 over L. So 
sorry 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 small v means uh, v going to zero yes sorry about that so set bar was one but v is just zero yeah is that okay yes Sure, I mean, yeah, so uh, the crossing equation is satisfied at every order. The small uh, assumption I made, just to make things less cumbersome, was that this delta phi does not depend on n. Of course, if you say delta phi is 2 plus 1 over n squared, then you would have to take that into account. But if delta phi is fixed, it's just 2, 3, 4, whatever, it's a number, then uh, this, this is correct. Yeah, but you're right. I assume that this doesn't depend on that. Now, let's look at the two examples we had, and, and, uh, and let's study this equation for the two examples. It would take, I think, like 15 more minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, it should be. So, this equation. So, let's, let's start first with the case one. So the case one, case one, there are no new operators. If you don't have new operators to order one over n square, yeah. Recall that these double trace operators have twist tau to delta phi plus 2n plus something small. But then, what does it mean? It means that if you if you have a look at this left-hand side, at the right-hand side, sorry, what that means is that the right-hand side, this G1 VU, this goes, remember, that goes like V to the tau over 2. So here we are considering VU, so we have exchanged the roles of, of, uh, of U and V. But then, this means that the power of V is always of the form delta phi plus n. But this V to the delta phi plus n exactly cancels this one in the denominator. Right? And you are always left with an integer power of V. So, this cancels the 1 over v to the delta phi. As a result, on the right-hand side of this equation, on the right-hand side, there is actually no enhanced divergences. This is already a quite remarkable fact. Now, if I tell you that there is no enhanced divergences on the right-hand side, what is your guess for all these functions, for all these coefficients v and m? Sorry? Yes, so basically, yeah, so basically what happens is that this v and m are all zero just as a consequence of the things we have been doing. No computation whatsoever. Uh, well, some computation. In particular, from this, one can deduce that gamma NL, and here I, I will make a very interesting comment, is equal to zero to all orders
in one over L. But actually, if I give you, imagine that I give you uh, polynomials on the left, right? And I give you with that, and I tell you that given polynomials of x with some n here, let's say hypergeometric functions are roughly polynomials, you have to give me a 1 over x. Of course, you will need an infinite number of polynomials. However, if I give you a square root of x, you also will need an infinite number of polynomials. So actually, these uh, enhanced singularities include also non-positive, sorry, positive non-integer powers. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to enter into that, but actually, even if you have a non-integer power of b, that's also enhanced. And the reason why it is enhanced, and this you can play with this, is actually very cool. You remember the d bar operator, that is, I think, set bar square, d set bar, 1 minus set bar, d set bar. And if you start with a positive power of set bar, of 1 minus set bar, let's say to the 3, and you act with this, you will never make this singular. However, if you start with an integer power, even positive, and you act with this, you will get something negative. That proves that this you cannot obtain from a finite number of conformal blocks. So this is also enhanced divergence. But yeah, anyway, but um, it's a bit technical. Yeah, now, so the condition from here, yes. We, we can go later. The, the, yeah, that's a very interesting fact. And, and I can, well, yeah. So I, I, in my last lecture, we will be even more, well, I can tell you, I just don't want to go too much or extra time. I, I will give, I will tell you in a second. Uh, let me tell you in a second. So, right. So the, the first note is that on the other hand, on the other hand, it is okay, it could be okay to have a solution, but you could have a solution where gamma and L is different from zero for, let's say, L is equal to zero. So this we cannot see in what we are doing. Solutions that are truncated in the spin, that are different from zero only for spin zero, we don't catch with a one over L expansion. Is it okay? So the claim is that in a one over L expansion, we get always zero, but actually you can have truncated solutions. I will go to answer your question in a minute. But before that, Let's study uh, the second case, which is a little bit more interesting. In the second case, and then I have several comments. So, ju just to answer your question, uh, in the ADS CFT duality, in the ADS CFT duality, <laughs> These four-point correlators, they have an interpretation of some diagrams in ADS. And people have computed these diagrams in ADS. And there are two kinds of terms that you can construct. And one is contact terms. And the Witten diagram is a little bit like that. And it so happens that for contact terms, you can see that gamma and L is different from zero only for, for a um, finite range of the spin. So the solutions, these sort of solutions, the solutions without a new operator, they correspond to these truncated solutions. They are much easier to find than, than the ones for large spin. So, yeah. So the heartbeat was the one we are going to solve now. Now, on the other hand, so let me, let me do, do the following, thank you. So imagine that we have, we do have a new operator. And there is a very nice example in which the OP of phi with phi has one plus phi, phi and L. So these are the usual double trace operators. And then, 
to order one over n square, you can have any other operator. And one nice example is phi itself. Yeah? Now, if, you, if that is the case, if that is the case, then means that the right hand side here, now the situation is more interesting because the right hand side has a u over v to the delta phi, and this is a new operator with OPE coefficient, let's set it to one, it doesn't matter, of order one over n square, and the twist of this operator is delta phi. That means that the power of V here, coming from its conformal block, is delta phi over two, times F, delta phi zero, is a scalar operator, V of U. And then we need to keep the log u. So now, on the right hand side, we will have this operator. So this is the conformal block of phi here. And in addition, we will have double trace operators. But exactly as before, double trace operators will not give an enhanced divergence. Is that fully clear? Yeah? So if you didn't have new operators, on the right hand side, all you had were double trace operators. But the twist of double trace operators is at least two delta phi plus an integer. So that doesn't give me any singularity. On the other hand, if you have, if you do have a new operator phi, it means that here, you have v to the delta phi over 2. But now, we do have something interesting. Because now, this v to the delta phi over 2 doesn't cancel this one. Right? So now, if you multiply this with this, they don't cancel anymore. Any longer. Case one. Now, in the EDS language, what this corresponds are to some sort of diagrams where you actually do exchange an operator. Now, those kind of diagrams are actually quite hard to compute from the EDS point of view. And actually, the anomalous dimension was not known for general delta before this, this little work here. So now we are in very good shape because we can have a look. We have our H, right? And we have this guy here. And then we match. We expand around V equals zero, and we match all the Vs. And then this allows to, again, match in enhanced divergences, we can compute gamma and L to all orders in 1 over L. And ju just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that one finds, for instance, if you have delta phi equals 2, the computation is very similar to the one we already did in our toy model, you, you look at the first two, three terms, and you can guess gamma and L. And gamma and L is actually beautiful. It's one divided L plus one, L plus two plus two N. And we have computed this without doing a single Feynman diagram. We have shown that this just follows from, you know, consistency and, and, um, and conformal invariance, et cetera, et cetera. Now, to, I promise to answer some of the questions. 
So the, the, the case, yeah, so the second case corresponds to these sort of diagrams. And even from the ADS point of view, it's quite complicated to do this. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the term D functions. No, better for you. It's, it's fine. <laughs> but the answer is quite complicated. So the answer for the four point function you can compute in this supergravity approximation, but it's the sum of several terms. And the sum, these kind of terms, they grow incredibly fast with this delta. And, and if delta is non integer, you obtain a, like an infinite sum over horribly complicated functions. So it, it's quite complicated. But from here, it's conceptually very simple. And it just follows from crossing. So what we will do in, in the next lecture tomorrow, we will see that actually with this method, we can solve many other conformal field theories. But solve in, 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 some, in some approximations. Uh, not to all values of the coupling, like here, 1 over n squared. So something we will see this 1 over n to the 4 for these theories that would correspond to loops in ADS, for which basically nothing is known. And also theories with higher spin symmetry, weakly coupled gauge theories, etc., etc. So thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Uh, 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 this the formula that you've written down that is for d equal to four is that right? Yes. So uh, this we, I mean, I, I can do two things. We, one can do it in d equals two and in d equals four, uh, and it's relatively simple. Uh, in any dimensions, you can also do this uh, as a sort some sort of expansion, and uh, yeah. I mean, I have to say that something that is, I think, the trickiest bit of this may be that I give you 10 of these coefficients, and you have to guess the function of j. And, and um, yeah, and that, uh, yeah, I was planning to talk about this uh, regarding the, this um, inversion formula. I, I am not sure I will have time. But um, uh, in principle, you, ca you can do that. But the expressions are much more complicated. And I don't know, I haven't guessed all that. For d equal to 3, you mean? Yeah, for instance, yes. Uh, it, it could be very interesting, actually. The point is that in d equals 3, the conformal blocks are much harder. Uh, uh, sorry, actually, with Shibo above, so if this little n is equal to 0, actually, for any exchange operator, we, we have this uh, up to like 100 terms. So, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, for the another dimension, you obtain what kind of theory you have in mind? Does it apply to? Oh, four? so actually, yeah. So um, the so at this order in one over n square, even if you study something like n equals four, this is all true. And but 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 of course the the. Um, what, what you have to be careful, so the assumptions, the assumption I have made here, this a simplifying assumption, is that we have this one operator exchange at order one over n square. If you have a full-fledged conformal field theory, in a full-fledged conformal field theory, it could be that you have infinite new operators exchange at order one over n square. Now, what happens in n equals four super n mills for some protected correlators, is that the OP coefficients of these new operators are such that this exchange is like a only one exchange again. So this should be interpreted, as I have discussed it, as some subsector of full-fledged theories, but actually one can also study th full theories with this method. It, it's just very complicated. So, so he, here we just took a generalized free field, it's a little abstract, and then, uh, but n equals 4 super n mills is very much like this. But you have to be careful because at order 1 over n square, it, it could be more messy than this. You could have, let's say, the stress tensor. That's something that you will always have at order 1 over n square. You will have many other fields, and you will have to take that into account. And, uh, all these are protected operators. 
Uh, well, for, for n equals four super enemies, one can choose protected operators. For a general conformal field theory, you, you don't expect to have, in general, protected operators. But this is something that people study a lot, actually. So this is like an effective field theory in EDS. It's dual to that, and people try to, to, to understand um, universal features from this. So it's a little bit more than a toy model. It, it's a toy model that people study, but it may not be dual to like, you know, full-fledged conformal field theory and a full-fledged quantum string theory on EDS. For that, the only case you can study is EDS-CFT, and you can study n equals four super n mills on one side, and, you know, supergravity or strings on EDS-5 cross F5 in the other side. You can do that too. It's just too complicated for, for, for these lectures. Yes? Uh, so the... Uh, L equal to zero case. Uh, uh, so for case one, uh, the scalar thing you said that though in general gamma and L equal to zero, but because perturbation theory breaks down at L equal to zero, you can have some contribution uh, coming to gamma and L uh, for the scalar. Absolutely. In the case one. Uh, yes. So, 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 so sorry. May I just put a parenthesis? So notice that a caveat of this, just very quick, a caveat of, of this method that I have, I have told to you is that it computes gamma and L as a perturbation in 1 over L. A question you can ask is whether the real function gamma and L is some analytic function and whether the sum of made is actually gives you the real value even for finite spin. The question, related question, is whether this could have, for instance, some e to the minus L. And if you have something like e to the minus L, you would never be able to compute. Now, I was planning to discuss how, from what we have said, one can understand, but there is a, an inversion formula that has been proposed in a very nice paper by Canon Watt, that basically it is now believed, it, it has been basically proven, that actually the CFT data is an analytic function of the spin. And all these sums, that we are computing, they do resum. We have seen it in, in specific examples. You can actually see that, but it is actually a more general thing that all these sums, they do resum into something nice and analytic, and that you can... So, so basically, there is a formula that computes, uh, that computes this CFT data from these enhanced singularities of the correlator, so very much like what we are doing here, but it is more manifest that the CFT data is an analytic function of the spin. And this, from a conceptual point of view, is quite powerful, because it means that, indeed, we, do, we can extrapolate this to finite spin, and we expect to find a right answer. And in that paper also, the, it is more clear that the ambiguity, there is some ambiguity for spin zero, but if the spin is two and higher, then there shouldn't be an ambiguity. And, and that is more or less understood. And uh, anyway, so, so this is some firmer footing, uh, thanks to this. I was going to explain that, but I, I didn't have time. I don't have time to do that. It would be 20 minutes. But I, I will be very happy to discuss. I have these two pages with that discussion. I can show you all we can discuss. Yeah, actually, uh, just to uh, understand, uh, so in this formalism, you are doing large spin uh, thing, and in the case uh, two, uh, in the same logic, one would expect that this gamma NL doesn't capture the full information about scalar L equal to zero, because in the left-hand side, you still have this one upon J, just conformal blocks, and so you are getting this BNM coefficient from expanding the anomalous dimension as a one upon J expansion. Absolutely, yeah. So in this case also, for scalar, that ambiguity re remains, for case two also, in the large spin perturbation theory. Yeah, I mean, for in actually, I have to say that once, so things are usually a little bit better, than one believes. Once you have found this, you can plug this back into the full correlator and you can check crossing symmetry and you can see whether crossing symmetry requires the addition of corrections for spin zero, spin two, etc. Just from the point of view of crossing, you can add these truncated solutions, but actually in many situations, the, situ the, the result is much better than expected. But you are absolutely right. I mean, there could be an ambiguity, and, and this ambiguity, uh, you know, so here on the left, 
if you are looking just at enhanced divergences, you could have an ambiguity for a spin 0, a spin 2, a spin 4. You could have that. And from what I have said, it's not clear why this is true. But this is an, in a better footing, and now people believe that indeed all this data can be pushed down to finite spin. Uh, and we have many, uh, yeah. So, so before, we were seeing that in many contexts, uh, and, and with, with this treatment of this inversion formula, it's more clear now. Okay, if uh, there are no more questions, um, let's thank Fernando again. Yeah.